Well, good morning. This is Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. Uh, and we are on a, a Zoom call here um, for an interview for the Kent State Guardsman Oral History Project. Um, thank you for agreeing to participate. So first things first, uh, what is your name and where are you from? My name is Avi Weiss and I live in Mayfield Heights, Ohio. And how and how for how long and in what capacity did you serve in the Ohio Army National Guard? I served um, a six year stint from January 2nd, 1970 to January 1st, uh, 1976. And do you recall the units that you served with? When I initially started, it was the 107th Armored, Armored Cavalry. Uh, I believe it was D unit or D group. Uh, after a year and a half, I transferred to, at that point, it was the 107th uh, Medical Unit. Uh, then they changed the name to the 112th medical unit or medical group. Mr. Weiss, why did you join the National Guard? Well, uh, I had signed up for the National Guard as a fluke. Um, Vietnam was going fast and furious. I was in college, but I still signed up uh, kind of to hedge my bet. When the first lottery took place, uh, I was very lucky and I hit number 57. Uh, that was not a very good number since they went to 200 and something the first year of the draft. So it became obvious that I was going to be in the Army. And the day after the lottery took place, I got a call from the Ohio National Guard saying that my name was finally at the top of the list. Am I interested? Needless to say, I was interested. Uh, and I joined the Ohio National Guard while uh, I was still in college on January 2nd, 1970. Uh, and so wh where were you for, uh, for college at the time? What were you doing during your years in the Guard? I was at Cleveland State University. I was in social work school. Um, I was in, I think, my second year or third year. And uh, I just returned to the country. I was overseas uh, in Israel for a year studying. And uh, they had called. Um, and how, how many times was your unit called out during your six years in the Guard? Well, in the first year, even before I went to basic training, we were called up for the post office strike, and we were called up for the Teamsters strike. Because I hadn't been to basic training yet, uh, they wouldn't trust me going out into the public. So I had weeks of KP and uh, in, in that period of time, because that's all they would allow me to do. Um, and help us out for those not in the know, what is KP? Kitchen patrol, great fun. It was, it was preparation for my wife. Uh, they, they trained me how to maybe clean uh, to meet satisfaction of my wife. They didn't do a good job, she'd tell you. <laughs> so, well, so full disclosure here, you were not deployed to Kent uh, in May 1970. Um, I found I found your name uh, in an article in the Cleveland Plain Dealer uh, from May of 1971, the following year, uh, because you were involved in an auto accident uh, while, while with uh, the National Guard. 
Um, so uh, we'll get to the accident in, in, in a bit here. Um, so where were you when you heard about the Kent State shootings? I was on a uh, rapid transit between the airport and a spot where my wife would pick me up. I was a regional director for a youth group, and I had, was just coming back from either Cincinnati or Dayton, uh, having made a field trip to meet with uh, the adult board and the kids in uh, one of the cities. And as I was riding the train, I kept noticing that there were an awful lot of people my age on the train. And it seemed unnatural that there were that many young people on the train. Uh, and that's when I found out about Kent State. Do you remember your initial reaction to this news? Uh, obviously some shock that it had happened. Uh, sadness uh, for the loss of life. And knowing that it was the National Guard that was out there, I had ambivalent feelings because I was a member of the National Guard. And I was a college student. So I felt it from both sides. When was the next time that your unit met for drill um, after the Kent State episode? I don't know. I would assume we met once a month. Um, Kent State was the beginning of the month, and I don't remember at this point which weekend of the month we would meet. So I, I can't answer that. Do you have any specific memories about about that first drill um, meeting after all this happened at Kent? Uh, perhaps the the mood of uh, of that weekend. I'm sure everyone walked on eggshells. Um, I don't think anybody in the guard wanted something like that to happen. Um, I'm sure that my unit didn't want it to happen. Were there strong feelings against uh, the protesters? Sure. Uh, here you've got a group of young people in their 20s carrying rifles having people swearing at them, throwing things at them, uh, berating them. Uh, but at the same time, they were out there to, to do what they were supposed to do. Uh, what they were supposed to do obviously wasn't to go kill people, but was to separate and, and try to contain what was going on. Um, Again, this is all conjecture. We're talking 50 years later. Um, as a person of 75, I would assume that's that's how I would have felt at that point. Mr. Weiss, do you recall any, uh, you know, the media coverage of of Kent or the National Guard kind of in the months or, or even the years after that, kind of during the, the rest of your time in the Guard? Well, obviously, people from the Guard were restricted from speaking to the press. Uh, that would happen today, too. Uh, if, you, if you want to find out something, go talk to... Uh, my superior officer, uh, you know, I, I'm a peon in this organization. Uh, I'm not supposed to speak with you. And for the most part, especially after Kent, I don't think that if someone would have come up to me, there's no way I would have spoken to them. Uh, number one, you'd have the retribution of the guard if, if you did talk to them. 
And number two, if you did speak to the press, are you doing is, is, is expressing your own personal view? Uh, you're not talking for the, for the guard and shouldn't be taken as this is the, the position of the guard. Mr. Weiss, you were, you were in Cleveland uh, when um, the investigation and trials uh, occurred at, at the uh, federal courthouse there. Um, how closely did you follow um, these proceedings? I followed them just because, again, I was a college student and also I was a member of the Guard. So I, I did follow them. Um, I mean, I sat and wondered why they would give firing pins and ammunition to go to a college campus. Um, it, it, there's no reason for that. But at the same time, nobody knew what was going to happen. Nobody knew if there was going to be violence, if there wasn't going to be violence. It was a no-win situation for both sides. Well, Mr. Weiss, I found your name in this uh, article about uh, a vehicle accident, a Jeep accident. And this is in May of uh, 1971. The headline here is, Two Guardsmen Injured Seriously. Um, thankfully, you were not one of the two seriously injured, but but your name appeared here in this uh, in this article. Um, can you tell us what happened? Okay, I was NCO of training, and I was riding in uh, a vehicle. There were five people: the driver, um, the lieutenant who was in charge of training a sergeant, myself, and a young guy who was regular army. And evidently when they came back from active duty, had to spend one summer uh, attached to a guard unit uh, to fulfill a requirement. So, the sergeant was riding in the back seat of the Jeep. Myself and this other person were riding in a trailer. Now, it was illegal for us to be in the trailer in the first point, but the lieutenant was telling the driver, we're late, go faster. So the driver sped up, and as he was going around the turn, the trailer, which I was in, was an open bed trailer, fishtailed into a rut, caught in the rut, flipped over the Jeep, flipped over the trailer. Uh, the Jeep was total. They air vacked out the driver and the sergeant. And the other three of us went bouncing down the road. And uh, we were in the middle of nowhere in Virginia, AP Hill, Virginia. And I ran down the road in the direction we were heading, looking for somebody to go back to the accident because two of the people were very seriously hurt. So we finally found somebody and they came out to where the accident was and they brought in a helicopter and air vac uh, the driver and uh, the sergeant to the hospital. And the other three of us ended up being taken by ambulance to the medical unit uh, had set up an infirmary and a, and a I don't wanna say a hospital, but a, but a care area uh, to take care of people who were hurt. And that's where I ended up. Uh, 
one person had, the sergeant had a broken back. The driver, I thought he had hurt, uh, had herniated this in his neck, but the article didn't say that. Uh, they put me on Demerol. Uh, I had lost my glasses in the accident. And they wanted me to go out and sleep on the ground overnight uh, and get back in a tank and start doing what I was supposed to be doing. Uh, that's how they handled the accident. I was approached by an inspector general who said to me, I want to know what happened to the accident. I said to him, I'll tell you what happened to the accident, but you got to get me out of this unit. Because if I tell you what happened in the accident, I'm going to be coached. Uh, he said, okay. Uh, I had a degree in social work. Uh, the guy who was playing social worker in this medical unit that was attached to the 107, and they were the ones who treated me uh, after the accident. Uh, and I grew up with a lot of these people. Said to me, you know, what are you doing driving a tank? got a degree in social work, come work in, in this department, transfer to the medical unit, and you'll be the social worker. And uh, I told the I told the inspector general what happened. And he got me out of that medical unit and out of the tank unit into the medical unit. Uh, and I spent the rest of my time in the Ohio National Guard as part of the medical unit. It was, it, was, it was an interesting experience. So when you, when you think back on your time in the guard, um, do you have a, kind of an overall impression of, uh, of this period in your life? Yeah, it, 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 on, on one week in the month, you, you spent your time hiding from anybody who could tell you what to do uh, in the building. Um, it was, it was an experience. Um, they really didn't train you to do anything. Um, especially in the tank core at that point. They obviously didn't have tanks around in, in, in the uh, armories here in Cleveland for you to go drive and, and, and learn from and experience what you're supposed to do, uh, aiming and shooting and, and, and firing the, the tank. Um, it, it, it was during summer camp. Um, there you got to maneuver with the tank and drive the tank. Okay. It was it was an adult babysitting service with nobody babysitting you. During the summer, it was a two-week vacation from work and home and your family. It was a joke. So here, here's a, a question. And, and, I, and again, I, I say this, you know, that, you know, you were not deployed to Kent, but this, was, is, this is certainly kind of the most um, famous uh, or infamous, whatever uh, term, most, most memorable and most notable, um, storyline in which the guard was involved in the 70s or, or ever okay yes. uh in 1970 this is the year this is when you started your time in uh in the guard and yes. even though you weren't there did you feel uh any of that um Did you feel any um, reaction, I guess, to you as a guardsman 
you know, in the years or months or years after that, just because you were a member of the guard. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone went out and publicized that they were a member of the guard. And also, people came back from that who then might have started college or went out to work. A lot of them didn't go around wearing the army uniforms either. It, it wasn't... Here they were going out and risking their lives overseas, but when they came home, they were berated for going into the army and going overseas. Same thing with people in the National Guard. Yes, it was a hedge that you didn't have to go to Vietnam because it wasn't like the Guard of today. You joined the Guard today, and if you look at all the people who went to fight in Desert Storm and, and the other incursions in the Middle East, a good proportion of those people were Guardsmen and still are. When I was in the Guard, that wasn't the case. We didn't get sent overseas. At the same time, because we were in the Guard, you didn't want to go out and overtly show that you were in the Guard. Because the public opinion was definitely not pro-military. Um, there were always people who supported the Guard. And the people who supported what went on at Kent State from the Guard's point of view, not the killing, but putting the Guardsmen there as maybe a buffer. But you put all these guardsmen out there and they weren't trained to be MPs. They weren't trained for crowd control. And that's a problem. Um, because you, you, you're talking 20 year olds standing against more 20 year olds. And many of the guards people I remember walking in, in Vietnam War protest marches through Cleveland State, and I wore my guard uniform to show that not everybody was in favor of it. It was a very confusing time, um, and nobody won. Definitely not the students. Do you remember or do you recall any specific instances where you were treated poorly if someone learned that you were a member of the Guard, you know, during the early 70s? No, not really. Um, I guess I was fortunate that I never was exposed to that. There may have been people that were. Um, I think people understood that the people went into the guard went into the guard basically to avoid going overseas the issue the issue comes where they trained to go out there and do what they were doing at Kent State that's the issue now I don't know if the units that were there if they were armored cavalry units or if they were military police units, that I, that I don't know. I know that my unit thankfully wasn't called up. And if we would have been called up, we would definitely not train to go out there. We were a tank unit. We were gonna bring tanks out to the campus so uh, I don't know. Uh, wasn't a good wasn't a good time. Have 
your feelings kind of uh, from the from the time you you know you heard about uh, the Kent State episode when you were in transit uh, till now, half century later. I mean, has have your feelings changed over the past fifty years in any way? Oh yeah. Uh, listen, when when I was uh, in my early twenties, I was I was a liberal and I was uh, fighting for this and fighting for that. It, it, there was always a cause to fight for back then. Um, now at 75 and I look back, um, I don't want to say that I've uh, gone off the deep end and I'm totally to the right, but I'm definitely a lot more conservative today than I was then. Um, whether it, I, you know, I, as my kids would say, I don't know how you got so smart so quickly. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm much more moderate than I was then. Uh, I, I think I could see both sides a lot clearer today than I could in the 20s. Uh, I, think, I, think that, I think that episode was one of the most important things that happened to change society in America. Uh, as a social worker, before 1970, people were involved in groups, especially young people, uh, youth groups, uh, liberal groups aligned to this and aligned to that. After 1970, people sat back and, and said, you know, I can get killed for my beliefs now. What do I really want to do here? And I think that membership in organizations across the board, even adult organizations, membership went down. People were afraid to align themselves with something that might not be the norm or what's accepted. There's always the counterculture. We have a counterculture today too. That'll always be there. Uh, but I feel there was a big shift in society after 1970. Well, Mr. Weiss, you, you mentioned culture today. I, I might just... Um ask this question you know in the past couple of years in this country uh there have been episodes of violent protest uh namely uh june 2020 after the death of george floyd and in january 2021 at the u.s capitol uh do you see any parallels or, or i should say what parallels do you see you know between those more recent episodes and uh campus protests uh, during the Vietnam War era? Interesting question. I think society has evolved into more radical protests over the past 15 years. Um, I don't know how anybody could have watched what happened to Floyd uh, with somebody sitting on his neck for all that period of time and they were recording it all and not be moved by that. Um, I mean, it's still going on. We also didn't have, when I was a kid growing up, school shootings. They happened yesterday. They're still happening. We didn't have the guns out there that we have today, the availability of the guns that are out there today. We've become so, well, it doesn't affect me, so I don't have to worry about it. And when it hits my doorstep, then maybe, then, then I'll get involved. Well, it's affected the black community. 
And there are a lot of whites who also have been affected by it. There's been abuse. There will always be abuse. The key is how do you constrain and the abuse? You've got a Supreme Court that's now very much to the right. You had the Warren Court that was very much to the left. Why they can't come up with something in the middle is beyond me. And I think we live in more dangerous times today than in 1970. 1970 was an isolated case. Yes, there were protests, there were people fighting, but there wasn't killing. You have a generation of kids who grew up playing war games on their playstations. And to them, killing, it's not real. So you got a kid who's 14 years old and goes out and gets a gun and kills somebody in school. That's how he grew up. My parents, when I grew up, didn't allow me to have a gun. When my boys grew up, and they're now 48 and 46, they didn't play with guns. I played with enough guns when I was in the Army for all of them. I also camped out enough in the Army for all of them. And when it came time for Boy Scouts, go find the father who wants to go camp out. This one's not camping out. But at the same time, we've We've nurtured the society that we now live in, of violence. And nobody's stopping it. And that's the sad part. That's, a, that's not a society that I want my grandkids to, to continue having to grow up in. And it's a shame. I went out and played at night. And as I, I left the house at 8 o'clock in the morning in the summer, came home at 6 o'clock for dinner, left after dinner, went out and played again. Kids today can't even go in their backyards and play in the front yards and play without somebody watching them. Sad commentary. Hmm. And whether that came from Kent State, I don't think it came from Kent State, but I think it came from a society that kept evolving and evolved the wrong way, quite frankly. And it didn't evolve for the better. And the soapbox. Is there any question or topic uh, that I have not asked uh, that you would like to comment on about either your time in the guard or about uh, or about Kent or about society in 1970? Is there a uh, Parting shots or final final comments. In nineteen seventy, in nineteen seventy, you were either with the war or you're against the war. And the people who were in the middle never said anything either way. Each side continued to grow stronger. I think as the war kept dragging on and the death toll kept increasing. And this was my graduating class who, I graduated in 1965 from high school. And there were people in my class who went after high school straight to Vietnam. And a good number of them didn't come back. The people from Vietnam, the soldiers who went to Vietnam and, and fought, they felt they either felt the commitment that they needed to go because they were Americans or because their parents were immigrants and America gave their parents a place to live and allowed them to grow up. They might not have been in favor of the war, but but they went and fought the war. 
the soldiers who came back from Vietnam never got the parades that everybody else got. I don't think anyone needed a parade, but an attaboy might have been nice at that point in time. Um, and there were people who fought there who might be, who might have been against the war, but they still felt the commitment that they had to go. I think we're seeing a lot more recognition of those soldiers today. And if you see the license plates now in Ohio, a number of them have the ribbon from Vietnam on their license plate. And they're saying that they're Vietnam War veteran. I don't think there's a stigma attached to it today like there was then. And that's a good thing. You know, they're, they're, they're people my age. And everyone, as they get to this age, wants to feel like they made a contribution. Well, part of their contribution, part of their legacy is those years. And that's important. Conversely, part of the legacy of the people who were sent to Kent State is what happened to Kent State. You know, did they fire their weapons out of fear once one person fired? And you, you can bring up the whole thing. Well, was there a guy in uh, on the protester's side who had a pistol and he fired and, they, and the guard thought that people were shooting at them. So they then shot at the other, at the students. I don't think we'll ever find out that answer. You're also not going to bring back the four people who died and you're not going to bring back the people who were wounded. And I had a lot of friends who were at Kent State at that point um, who were either taking pictures of what was going on and one guy's pictures were in the library over at Kent State for the 4th of July, uh, for the uh, May 4th, uh, museum and then and, and, and the, I, don't, I don't know what it's called at this point. The guardsmen didn't want to be there. That I can tell you. The, I didn't like getting called up for any of the things that got called up for. Took me out of school, took me out of my home life. But that was part of the commitment that I made for six years. Mr. Weiss, what, what would you say to the to those members of uh, you know the other members? There was another company from the 107th Armored Cavalry, you know, which was your regiment. Right. Uh, that was on campus, you know, at Kent or, or the other units of the National Guard. What would you say to those guys? I, I would basically say I'm sorry that you were put in that situation. I'm sorry that anyone would have been put in that situation. And that you did the best that you could do. And... You can't live your entire life in that moment. You, you have to go on living. I'm not saying to minimize what happened, but I don't think you can ever minimize what went on there. But at the same time, I don't feel that they were responsible really for what happened there. I think the people who were responsible were the people who ran the Ohio National Guard, who didn't train the people. And then they sent them out. I mean, they said, I don't know this for a fact, but I, when we were called up for the Teamsters strike, 
I'm not sure that the people who were from my unit went out with firing pins. They might have had live ammunition, but I'm not sure they had firing pins. Now, I could be wrong, um, but that's how I remember it. Um, who sends people to a college campus with the ammunition and firing pins? We were set up to lose. And, and I'm sure that what happened there affected some of these people and still affects some of these people. Now, it's one thing to go into, into war and shoot at people. Another thing to go to a college campus and shoot at people. Now, today's society, with all the the games that they play on Xbox and, and, and all the other things, killing somebody's second nature. I've already said that because they're not real. And to a lot of these people, the people that they're killing aren't real. It's just an extension of the games that they play. And it, it's too bad. It's a society we live in. Uh, we're going to end up with everybody. It's going to be the wild west. Everyone's going to pack and carry. In Ohio, you don't need a license anymore. Anybody can carry. You know, I go to synagogue every week. We've got a policeman standing out front watching who comes in the door with somebody who's a member of the congregation. 50 years ago, when you went to church or you went to the temple, you didn't have that problem. But we got it today. Because we there are an awful lot of sick puppies out there today. And it's very sad. Uh, I believe my generation was the luckiest generation. We grew up at the right time. We had families. Uh, that were, in most cases, nuclear families, husbands and wives and kids. You went out and played. You appreciated the fact that uh, you had the ability to go out and play. Today, you can't let your kid go out and play. It's a shame. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Is there anything else that you would like to add to this interview? No, I, ju I just, you know, for the, again, for the guardsmen who were there, you have a life to live, live it. I don't know if they're still reliving Kent State or not. I don't know if I would hope that, that, that they've become productive members of society since then. Uh, and for the families who lost kids there, there's nothing you can say to those parents or those siblings. Nothing. Because it was needless still and needless deaths. You know, and you, you brought up what's going on today with with uh the Floyds and all the other instances of abuse. We've become so second nature to the violence and to what's going on. That every, it slides off your back. And that's too bad. I'm glad I'm the age I'm at that I am. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for participating um, in this project. And I, I wish you good luck with it. Uh, I don't know if I shared was any use to you or not, but uh, 
thanks for giving me the soapbox to stand on. <laughs>